Welcome to the show. This is Brandon Wen, and you're listening to the Understanding Consumer Neuroscience Podcast, brought to you by the folks at Cloud Army. In this episode, Richard talks to Sam Tatum, Global Head of Behavioral Science at Ogilvy, about the role evolutionary psychology and behavioral science can play together to connect with people. Sam talks about systematically approaching creativity and embracing the solutions of the past to improve the future. Sam is also the author of Evolutionary Ideas, which digs deeply into ancient innovations that can solve tomorrow's challenges. Hi, this is Richard Campbell. Thanks for listening to Understanding Consumer Neuroscience. Today, my guest is Sam Tatum, who's the global head of behavioral science at Ogilvy. His passion is understanding human behavior, and his experience comes from organizational industrial psychology and advertising strategy. Welcome, Sam. Thanks so much, Richard. Lovely to be on. I'm, I'm excited to have you on, and I, I love that your background is more on the psychology side, because neuroscience is adjacent to that, but they're not the same things either. Yeah, I think, I mean, everything under the, the broader banner of, of understanding our, our brains and how mm-hmm. it informs our, our behavior, but, but certainly there's, there's, a, there's a lot to be learned in, in the specifics of neuroanatomy and how we can track things more clearly by better understanding the brain. We sort of tend to be more on theoretically based hypothesis testing. So what do we assume that someone might respond in a certain mm-hmm. circumstance? What's the, what's the basis for that? Uh, and and is it, it can it be proved or, or disproved? And starting with that idea that asking them is not a good idea. <laughs> asking them what they think yes. or what they think they might do, it tends not to be the, the, the right idea. What we find is that oftentimes it can, their actual behavior, people's actual behavior can be um, completely opposite to what they might anticipate. Yeah, absolutely. And you've got a book coming called Evolutionary Ideas. And that is, it seems like you're tying into the old ways of thinking that modern thinking may have suppressed that may make more sense in this modern time than they than they have in the past. That's that's right. So the, the, the book Evolutionary Ideas is really about better understanding patterns of human behavior. Mm-hmm. And really what's enabling us to spot these patterns more easily, I think, is the growing world of behavioral science, behavioral economics, that's applying a a language to sort of map these consistencies in how we respond in in certain circumstances. So we're able to see that people sort of tend to follow the herd. We're able to, we call that social norming, Mm -hmm. or we're able to see that people have a broader tendency to be loss averse, or we have a a, a tendency to pursue a sunk cost. And and sometimes these, these, these sort of this vernacular and sound over overly complex, but it actually enables us to see things that we otherwise we otherwise wouldn't. Yeah, in some ways, it takes the emotion out of it when you talk about it, the sunk cost fallacy, rather than talking about well, you've already invested that thing. Why wouldn't you keep investing in it, even though it's not? And, and that's it. And and that will be the and that sort of makes intuitive sense, right? And mm-hmm. there's a lot of this. A lot of behavioral science is sort of organizing our intuition, right? Uh, the saying sort of a, a watch pot never boils is sort of lovely kitchen wisdom to show that sort of unoccupied time feels longer than occupied time. Yeah. I mean, given ye shall receive is a lovely way of sort of framing reciprocity. Mm-hmm. So these are things that I think instinctively we've sort of known, but now we're able to sort of codify it more clearly and validate it experimentally. Do you think that the complexities of modern culture have accelerated this need that the people are sort of falling back on more visceral behaviors because they are overwhelmed? I think. Um, we know that we have a tendency when under stress and pressure mm-hmm. to revert back to more hardwired res- responses, more instinctive responses. So I, I've not seen studies to suggest the increased instances of us, what might be considered sort of falling prey to these biases or heuristics, mm-hmm. more so based on modern society. But we know in certain circumstances where they're sort of information rich or um, there's sort of too many sort of pieces of stimulus and distraction that they can be great examples of where we tend to close off <laughs> right. and, and maybe be sort of more prone to these instinctive drives. Yeah, I think it's very challenging for a marketer today living in a world where people are exposed to so much more advertising than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago to say, you know, is this even an effective strategy anymore? Like, how do I get my message out or, or persuade folks to pay attention to my product? And, and that's and that's it. And that's where... Um, that behavioral science helps us and, and also what I sort of focus on in evolutionary ideas can, can help us to better understand the nature of the, 
the, the challenge that we're faced with. I mean, every time we advertise, we're looking to to achieve an outcome. <laughs> we're, right. we're faced with a challenge. We want it to either sort of shift perceptions or aid a decision or or drive a behavior. And if we can better understand, this is a message about trust, right? So we need people to trust us. Actually, mm-hmm. the, the, the medium might be more important than the message. Here. So actually having sort of choosing selecting public billboards or big red bus signs I mean, can be actually a far more effective strategy than the message that goes on it because this is really about ensuring that lots of people are seeing your your message right so right. it's a, it's a, it's a signal of trustworthiness but is that and is that locale important too is there something about the permanency of a billboard or the of the side of a bus that lends credibility i think there's there, there's there has been um, research conducted on on digital advertising and, mm-hmm. and particularly some personalized advertising that sometimes because because it's just delivered to you it it, it sort of removes the 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 benefits of the signal that right. actually lots of other people are viewing this too um, I speak about this in the book. During the during the pandemic, there were moments in the UK where all sort of key free to air channels presented the same COVID messages at the same time. I mean, so this is like everyone is seeing this. I mean, they can't be lying to all of us, right? Um, so having some sense of 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 sort of what would be sort of reputational cost. I mean, enough people are seeing this that can call bullshit if someone knows the truth. Right. And also, when you think about permanency, again, that's another sort of investment right so we're, we're really drawing this commitment we're putting it in the concrete where we expect ourselves to be held accountable rather than a sponsored post on an instagram feed that's lost on the on the kilometer of instagram that you scroll that day well and the the folks that sell us the ads on those social media sites are very keen on the fact that you can target the ad very precisely but i wonder if we've hit a point with the market where they've desensitized to that 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 over targeted marketing now drives customers away i think it's one of those those annoying answers of sort of that that depends <laughs> <I mean. laughs> so it might depend on on what again what we're trying to achieve if mm-hmm. it's if it's uber google facebook looking to reinforce trust in the privacy of their platform right we might find that actually using more traditional means, doing a Super Bowl ad or having a having a more sort of physical billboard, is a better strategy, um, because of the reputational costs and exposure that that gains. Yeah. If it might be about um, building personal affiliation or triggering action or or or, or reinforcing um, long term behaviour with a sense of loyalty and understanding and and relationship building, then that's where it can actually be quite. Uh, Quite, quite valuable. Again, the, we, we need to consider the channel just as we consider the message in response to what's the, what's the outcome that, that we're driving here. Um, and, in, and in the book, I, I, I sort of break um, the, the, the sort of the doing elements of the book. So where we, mm-hmm. we spend a bit of time understanding these patterns of ideas. Um, and there are patterns of ideas that we see in evolved biology, there are patterns of, 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 of solutions, I should say, solutions that we see in evolved biology. There are patterns of solutions we see in evolved technology. And there are certainly patterns that we're now more able to spot in our evolved psychology. Mm-hmm. And what we do is explore what patterns or what psychological principles might be most relevant when we're looking at reinforcing trust, when we're looking at aiding decision making in a complex environment, when we're looking at triggering action. Or boosting loyalty, or improving an experience, so we can start to see again. Rather than sort of let's try, let's start with a blank sheet of paper and explore mm-hmm. everything in the world. What's a what's a good space that we can start? And where can we borrow or steal from to accelerate that process? Yeah, and, and I appreciate that, and and it, and I really like your your corollary with the pandemic, where government took advantage of those mediums to create this single message, which is what a remarkable test that we'll probably never yeah. get to repeat as any given organization. I mean, those big tech giants can buy a lot of ads, but not like yes. not like the UK government could. But I'm now I'm thinking about how a small organization might do this. Like you've sort of poked at that trust mechanism. Like the, to me, the low cost trust strategy is the personal influence, the, the customer persuading another customer model. And that is a different way to talk. It is, and that's sort of there's sort of a couple of different ways of an old, an old, an old sort of mentor, Jerry Siren, if he's if he ever listens to this, had a lovely way of ex- ex- describing this. Is sort of you can have borrowed trust, earned trust, and and blind trust. Right. And there are some things you just have blind faith, um, and and sometimes you can you can put elements of of deeper belief and religion in. Sort of I have sort of strong sort of 
firm views and, and that can be sort of blind blind trust mm-hmm. when you have sort of earned trust it's the things that you do right so it's like how do i how do you sort of put your money where your mouth is it's the classic sort of right movie. Walk the walk the talk. But that means I've already got your attention enough that I'm even have an opportunity to earn your trust. Or, or yeah, it, certainly I've got your attention. Um, but but it's the way in which I respond, in which is like, well, that's actually a cost to yourself, or you're you're really putting your belief on the line here. Right. A lot of the work that the Patagonia does, for example, and the the way they um, the way they conduct business in right. line with their belief is a really great way of like actually it's sort of earned trust. And then you have borrowed trust, mm-hmm. and that's where, as you sort of suggest, in the world of of influencers and actually finding people who are aligned with our brand or aligned with our audience mm-hmm. to help us to gain ears or gain eyes and, and start to build trust. Uh, and, and that's another sort of powerful element of, of behavioral science as well, the, the, the messenger. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes, we, again, we know the messenger can be more powerful than the message itself. Um, and we have explored as, 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 as Ogilvy working um, with very different messenger groups, for example, in the US looking at vaccine hesitancy. Mm-hmm. In, where you can actually look at what might be considered quite similar messages just delivered by very different sort of tribal identities right. to gain right. some sort of a gain some sort of alignment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that creates an entire story that's less and less based on fact in some cases. Like the tribalism is a remarkable force that uh, that creates that self reinforcing narrative and creates that. Well, that's what everybody believes. When, mm. Even though it's only in a very particular circle, and that can be that that can be the something that we can work with, or that can be the challenge yeah. that we're yeah. that we're up against. So how do we? How, it, it, then it becomes an exercise in framing how we how we framing our our, our objective, uh, and, and that can be from a brand or from a government. Um, mm-hmm. How do we frame our objective in a way that's aligned with that that worldview? Right. Um, so it doesn't feel sort of so we're not like a sort of a bad organ transplant that's rejected by the body. <laughs> it's yeah. sort of, it's, it's accepted and, and owned, uh, even if it can be sort of fundamentally the same outcome of the next tribe that we approach in a slightly different way. Yeah. No, and, I, and I can see that that gets, it's very costly to hammer a, or, you know, sort of swim against the tide there. You can keep trying to hammer your message. It's just, you're going to spend a ton to do that. Better to figure out the things that matter to folks and, and be more thoughtful and spend less. That's and and at worst we we experience reactance. I mean, so mm-hmm. we know this. Uh, an, another lovely term that behavioral science gives us the sort of sense of reactance that if a messenger that we see is dissimilar to se- to ourselves, mm-hmm. um, uh, sort of pr- propose a, a, an ask or an action that that we see to limit our own personal freedoms, then we tend to react against it and, and go the, the, the message is almost moot at that point. The, you're you're already it's, pushing them away before you heard them. Even, even not not even just neutral. A moot can be sort of negative. It yeah. can just actually inflame the opposite. You know? yeah. And the amount of times you see sort of don't walk on the grass or tourists go home and and people sort of lovingly taking pictures in all these spaces they shouldn't. Yeah, lovely examples of sort of reactions <laughs> in, the, in the wild. It's an old Ron White joke. The sign says no dogs. The sign exactly. is wrong. It should say two dogs. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that's a, an interesting point that, and I think it's also part of the modern culture too, that you are seeing strong enough tribalism that not only is your message not being received, but is driving them further away. That's right. That's right. And that's, and that's the greatest risk when we, when, um, particularly when we're, we're looking at, um, what we've experienced recently with, with, with COVID or, or as many parts of the world still, still experiencing, mm-hmm. um, where there is good evidence to suggest that wearing a mask and, and keeping a distance and, and certainly with the vaccine that there, there is sort of, there is, there is great science behind a, 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 an approach that can be accepted differently by different groups. Yeah. It's remarkable how unpersuasive data can be. Data in itself again. So it's yeah. just, just presenting the numbers and that's where I, the, the, the task of creativity and reframing the ask or reframing the data in a way that's clear, that is concrete, that's motivating. Um, so I've done a lot of work out of the out of the U.S. as as Ogilvy, mm-hmm. Chris Graves, uh, who's really leading the charge in 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 the U.S. here, and has done a lot of work in cultural cognition and better understanding differences between groups. But we're starting to find sort of even just remember the simple power of analogy mm-hmm. I mean, in explaining how a vaccine works. Right. And I've seen we sort of get 
I'm, I'm back in Australia at the moment and we see we sometimes we can pick up sort of satellite from different pockets of Australia and different communities and how different regional communities are, are looking to communicate the same thing and it, some it's framing it like a boxer right. <laughs> preparing for preparing for the fight that when the virus comes and others which is more sort of AFL Australian Football League sort right. of territory it's taking another approach so it's really it sort of remind ourselves just the power of narrative and metaphor and storytelling to help and that, that regionalization, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure cricket is effective in Australia. I don't know how effective it would be in Canada. It would be. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's right. Much less Aussie football, which is clearly yeah. its own crazy thing. Yes, but totally. I, finding the right, the right cultural sort of code to tap into to help us not spend our time in, in complex data and numbers that the brain is sort of doesn't compute very well. Right. I mean, we've not evolved to do mathematics, right? We've evolved to... We've evolved to interpret and deliver stories. Um, right. So, so things that can be delivered in that format with really rich, vivid, concrete concepts, they they tend to stick with us. So, where does neuroscience come into this play? Like, I I like I get I have a good product that seems to be the starting point or good data one way or the other. Now I'm trying to craft it into a message that is going to have meaning for a given audience. So, so for us, the thing where we've um, worked more in, in partnership i think with neuro neuroscientists and, mm -hmm. and organizations that have a have a stronger new, specific sort of neuro background um i personally come as you mentioned from a psychology background yes. working more broadly with behavioral economics behavioral science for us i think it can be well, a, a couple of different ways one is helping us get to us a, a read of effectiveness faster right um by better understanding sort of implementing some of the tools that are available through through neuroscientific methods um, and uh, and there are, there are a, a suite of a, a suite of different ways in which we can explore this, from eye tracking studies to, to EEG to better understand mm -hmm. um, uh, what elements of the what elements of the brain are active or activity levels in itself. We can look at sort of galvanic responses. We can sort of see actually how our body is responding to different messages. That involuntary skin response. Exactly. So there's, there's ways in which we can sort of start to see is the, the message having some sort of physical effect that, mm -hmm. that's showing a, 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 what might be considered a, stre a stress response, but that's an engagement response. Yeah. Um, all the way down to work that we've done in the past in implicit association testing and seeing how speed of response and association um, can help us to see, well, if this is the message that we're looking to present um, to our audience that's helping to, uh, to, to, to frame our product as a, as a refreshing product, this is the this is the specific campaign or specific line that seems to be most aligned with the associations of refreshment right. versus this one, and we're able to do that faster. Right, is it? It's, and, and presumably at lower cost. Like in theory, if I simply did every ad campaign, sales would tell me which one worked. It's just kind of an expensive and slow way to go. Uh, it is, and I and I think that there's a there's always a point in time and on a on an innovation sort of journey for this sort of research mm -hmm. and 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 because we one thing that we tend not to suffer from is is not having enough ideas about determining which ones to invest in right um and so s s some testing that we've done in the past with with um with neuroscience partners uh, 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 richard i know you're you're associated i'm not sure you're associated with cloud army i am associated with cloud but army but yeah this is a, this is a, a, a business that we've, we've worked with in the past as, mm -hmm. as well but we're able to help to more cost-effectively filter out or go from many different variants of a message to a fewer different sort of variants. And, and then we can go to the field, but at least we go to the field with two. And is that at a, at a sort of storyboarding phase? You're just sort of mocking it up and doing some layouts? Uh, it, it can be, it can be at, at concept, almost sort of proposition phase. Right. You know, this, is the, this, is the, this is the direction versus this direction, or okay. this is the specific claim. I mean, we've done work, um, whether it's from – Adult incontinence adds to donation prompts. You know, mm -hmm. Different how different language makes a difference. Sure, we know that looking at sort of bladder weakness, for example, is is it tends to be the way that the category speaks to 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 to, to incontinence. Um, but we know that's sort of inherently negative. Yeah, we found yeah. using some of these methods that actually framing it as manageable bladder weakness is a is a more positive way it's so simple in retrospect mm -hmm. it's like yes it's not a good thing but it's manageable yeah and we uh, help you manage it right it, exactly so subtle sort of small elements of language even in one i think our best performing claim looked at and um, reframing sort of the, the the negative of bladder weakness to 
having a relaxed bladder. Right. So it's being, being weak is bad, being relaxed is good. Yeah. So it can be literally looking at words, some wordsmithing earlier on that, that is anyone within an agency, if that becomes your proposition, then that shapes an entire campaign from manageable bladder weakness to having a relaxed relaxed bladder that can take you into 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 a couple of different spaces right yeah and i, and I think they, you you package it into these different kind of messages these are hilarious products too it's like oh boy i have to sell this clearly there's people who need it they just don't want to tell me yeah <laughs> and and you have to frame it in a way that makes it acceptable for them to want it too so that's it's, right it's a it's a great set of patterns and it, it is very interesting to see where that testing can take place uh I guess the further down the path you are, the more assumptions you've already made and are maybe harder to reverse. Like you're talking in that early proposition phase, you're just throwing that. That's almost just straight up brainstorming. You're throwing ideas out there. It's almost a challenge to figure out what to test. We can have too many directions, but important for us that we always have a hypothesis as behind why we would be testing a mm -hmm. specific brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that then helps us to stay true to that concept as we get in richer forms of execution. Um, but the, from, from, from our experience, it's been a sort of earlier stage, um, but, but I know of other brands and organizations that have, I mean, and clearly testing adverts and ad sets mm -hmm. before, they, before they go into final polish. So these sure. are ways in which we can start to track engagement. And that can even be, and, and, and Richard, I think you'll be likely closer. I'm sure you're closer to this than, than I am, but even looking at micro expressions through our camera that we can mm -hmm. start to sort of see sort of subtle smiles or frowns or points of engagement with there, there are just really fascinating ways we can begin to use technology to get a better read than we would have otherwise. And again, going from many possibilities to the few that we should really invest in is where I think there's a, there's a great, there's a great role for this kind of research. Yeah. So a variety of technologies for measuring too, but it also that variety of times uh, in an earlier show, we had a conversation about testing movie trailers. So, I mean, you're at a point where the movie's almost in its final edit. And now you're just trying to figure out what's the best way to promote it. You know, you're a long way down the path. A lot of money's already been spent and you're still trying to optimize marketing. So it makes a lot of sense, but it does speak to that range of we're just brainstorming ideas. Let's test a few to figure out which ones seem to resonate with the market we care versus we've got this product and we're in the final stages to try and put it out there. You know, which one of these four approaches do you think will be the one that'll, that'll reach the market we want? Yeah. And I think it can work at, at either at either stage. It just sort of depends on 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 the the role of the research. Um, if it's sort of final selection versus sort of consolidation, sure. Further investment. Now, or, or learning, because the nice thing about this is we always every time we research, and whether that's through neuroscience methods that we're discussing now, or or um, sort of intervention pilots, every time we we test, we learn, and we can optimize different appetites. Uh, and stages of development can call for, for for this kind of research at different stages. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. It's different folks are responsible at different times and want to put in neuroscience into the equation. It doesn't seem like there's any one right way. Like there's a bunch of ways to get it, to involve neuroscience in the process to really measure things. It's what are you responsible for, and and where do you see results? That's right. Yeah, and and. And this again is not explicitly my area of, of, of expertise, mm -hmm. and, and surrounding ourselves with with organisations that can help us to recommend the best methodologies right. um, to answer the questions that we have in the most efficient way, and 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 when we can use um, algorithmic responses. I mean, I know we we we're exploring in in other other sort of parts of our organisation how we can begin to look at. Um, better understanding personality profiles of different audience groups and and other cognitive traits and there's times after some time we have a a, a, a group of brand advocates right um that we're able to actually get a get a read of individuals and and through machine learning we don't necessarily need to test adcepts against people we can test adcepts against an algorithm that's been based off the audience that we already understand so we're not looking again to um, to recruit participants to view different things, we actually have a. We're able to again co codify that, right? And model it. You, you've it. done it enough now. You've got a model that w is repeatable. We, we, we sort of understand that, that. We sort of understand the expected response, and we sure. can put a different put a, a different stimulus out there, and 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 essentially we'll we'll get a read. No research is perfect. No, um, but it's about what's the what's the time in the journey and, and what are we looking to achieve and, and what's the cost or implication of this and the attractive thing sometimes is that we can get a we can get a good read 
quickly, relatively inexpensively, as compared to putting out two ads and seeing what in two different markets and seeing what drives uptake. Well, and, and that's an interesting aspect of this. And I've already in the, in the conversations around nudging and such, which says you know, it's getting away from that idea of the one perfect ad will create the sale as opposed to its many touches of a product's brand and messaging that ultimately lead to a sale. I think there's that wonderful um, saying, and I'll, I'll butcher it now, but sort of brands are like bird nests. Mm -hmm. They're sort of built one twig at a time. So in, certainly in, in brand associations, it's mm -hmm. about a richness of touch points. And, um, but, but on occasion, again, it that, that frustrating answer, again, it sort of depends. It depends what we're, we're asking of people. Um, or what we're expecting of, of people. If we're talking about long-term brand advocacy and loyalty, I mean, there's lots of research to suggest that that doesn't really exist anyway. <laughs> um, right. That, and, and but if there's if there's if it's about trial or if it's about um, looking at sort of per perception shift, you mean that there there is a there is a, a role of repetition and familiarity and just landing that. I think sort of when you when you feel that people have got the message, just tell them one more time. Um, so again, it really sort of what, d depends on what we're looking to achieve as to sort of how rich a tapestry we need to build or whether there can be something quite simple. Um, and it doesn't need to be messaging. And that's where I think a lot of actually a majority of our, of our work at, at Ogilvy in the behavioral science practice, mm -hmm. a lot of it actually doesn't live in the world of communications or, or marketing. It's, it's around building a, a context in which decisions can occur. So if we're looking at... Hmm security processes in, a, in an airport actually some of the most effective elements aren't sort of the, the 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 posters that people read on their way to it because as we spoke at the very beginning yeah you're people in an are airport, pretty blind to that they're just walking panic at you totally the stimulus rich environments that yeah. you're just on autopilot and you're just wondering if you've forgotten your passport so so there could be other ways in which we can achieve a desired outcome by communicating and needing to go necessarily through consciousness um to understand that um, so a lot of what sort of gets us excited is about sort of context change or, or, or subtle shifts in a procedure or a process that can have a desired outcome, even if we don't necessarily need to consciously process it. Yeah, and preferably not consciously process it. Yeah. I also think it's fascinating, like now you made me think about airports, and goodness knows I spent enough time in those. You have a harder time seeing the sign on the wall or the the scroll of stuff, or even if they're calling your name, you probably miss all that, versus as soon as you look at your phone, you give so much more attention to your phone. Yes. The information is there. You'll get it right away. Like it's, it's really in my best interest as a marketer to get to the, to the device that you trust versus the broader things that you trust less. And, and, and in that to tap into something that you, again, you, you, you naturally, um, sort of habituated to go to. So if there's a mm -hmm. push notification that can tell you about a slight difference in our security process, so you sort of naturally go to you. So, so that's just a way of, 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 of increasing that increasing that degree of salience. Yeah. Um, so, so being creative with the, the, the devices and the way to, to, to interact. But you're right. I mean, with, I mean, I find airports to be a fascinating, a, a fascinating context for this work. We've mm -hmm. done several projects in, in airports. And I do write about it a little bit because in – in airports, it's one space that you can't sort of guarantee any one language. All right. No. So, so, you, um, so in the book, I explore sort of concreteness. I and mean, we've talked a little bit about sort of concrete language and metaphors um, just, just now, but actually there are examples where visual concreteness can be really important. So, so if you're looking to encourage people to recycle, don't sort of have a, have a sign that says coffee cups here, have a bin that's shaped like a coffee cup. Right. Bin. If you're if you're if you're looking to warn people of sort of this is slippery when wet, there's a there's a there's a wonderful that's called the banana cone um, safety device. <laughs> it's sort of a safety cone that looks like a banana peel. You know, and that's a really intuitive right. bit. There is there is sort of cultural relevance there. I don't know. Bananas are kind of everywhere in the world. I think we've all seen the slip. <laughs> we've also I think now we're, I hope, uh, but 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 that's it's a lovely intuitive way yes. of communicating. It's an, is that, and we both got a little bit of a grin on an ta audio talk show, but it's the slight bit of humor probably triggers the mind the right way to acknowledge what that actually is. It just draws you to it. It's different. It's yeah. different. It, it's, it's not relying on, on, on reading words. Based com yeah. Completely. I mean, we, again, we evolved sort of drawing, drawing cave paintings and telling stories, not, not reading texts. Yeah. Um, so, so actually using the visual domain, and again, it's, it shouldn't be news to us as marketers and advertisers that the visual world is super important, but there are ways in which we can start to 
particularly in airports, we can't assume any one language works anyway. Right. That, that, that we tend to find these patterns of ideas um, pop up. Yeah, this iconography, this these, these yeah. sets of symbols that are universal, but and yes. still persuade. Still yes. get to the things yes. that matter. I mean, this sort of pokes against the the and maybe a whole other show I should be doing that the creation of a great logo is a fascinating side of symbology. That yes. what, why is this more effective than that? How how does this swoop convey trust? Uh, yes. And pl- much less the color choices. Certainly, in pre- past conversations had this. We showed it in blue, got this set of reactions. Showed it in red, this set of reactions. Otherwise, same picture. Like yes. that to me, I find extraordinary as a marketer. Just like, how could this be true? Yeah, and there's, I mean, it's, it's as you say, it's probably an, another podcast, maybe mm-hmm. one I'm less less qualified to just to, to speak to. And but there is, it is a fascinating category when you're looking at what you can communicate in something so single minded right. and. Uh, and uh, and I think there's two, two things here. One is what's um, what's embedded within a logo design. I mean, there's always the classic FedEx you know, in that's mm-hmm. that uses the, the sort of diametrically opposed colours of the purple and the orange, and there's a subtle arrow in the E and the X you know, or the D. So so really, sort of uh, uh, these lovely sort of nods by 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 design. But I think there's also then the meaning that you imbue on a on a on a logo over time. So whether the whether a swoosh starts being trustworthy, or whether over time that swoosh is associated with it with with trust, right? Um, that's the sort of the, 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 what we what we build over time versus what we embed from the beginning. Yeah, is is the entity trusted, and the swoop is associated with the entity, and so that's why the swoop is trusted. Or can a can a logo independent of an entity actually engender trust? That seems crazy to me. Seems crazy, but I, th- I think you'll find. Uh, I'm sure we'll find on on um, and I can't necessarily explain the differences as to why. And sure. it could be about curvature. It could be about associate. Again, it's like this is the the, the wonderful thing about the, the the brain is its infinite complexity. Yeah, <laughs> so it could just be round enough to remind you of a Starbucks, but has nothing to do with Starbucks. You know, yeah. and that's what we're picking up on. Sure. Um, but again, by by having options and asking questions and having consistencies in response, sometimes we don't need to know. We just need to be able to select. There was there was a period in human evolution where we weren't writing, but we were making glyphs, right? Like somehow we were making logos that conveyed meaning. Yes, uh, yes. So it is pretty ancient part yes. and, and a part of our evolved self to create symbols of meaning, one way or the other. Yes, that's uh, a fascinating place. Fascinating place, and a, and a great, uh, maybe a great place to leave off here. The book's evolutionary ideas coming out in May of twenty twenty two. In May, so tenth of May, it, it, it launches. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been a it's been a, a, a lovely sort of project over, over over many years to to help to hopefully frame the category of behavioral science and, and its role in innovation in a slightly different way um, to remove some of the complexity um, and to actually see that it's all around us. These ideas and these solutions are all around us. We just haven't necessarily been able to spot them as easily as we can now. Or they are they're they're so apparent that you don't even see them anymore. I mean and the, you, you you talk about a lot of physical things that have evolved, the, the shape of a of a dorsal fin, those sorts of things. They're all evolved asteroids, so whether we think about it or not. We tend to see only the end game. That's right. I mean, and you, and, and it's, you, as you say, you can see a dorsal fin, you can see a beak, you see a wing, you can see mm-hmm. these amazing evolved biological solutions across a bat and a flying fish and a bird. Right? They've all evolved to sort of convergently evolved to feature a wing, mm-hmm. but we don't tend to see them. These patterns of ideas so easily between a a baker and a banker and a bus driver. Mm-hmm. But once you know what you're looking for, you can say actually there are some things that are fundamentally the same. Right. Um, that if you're faced with the same challenge, just as a, a shark and a dolphin are faced with the challenges of of navigating the oceans and and capturing prey. Yeah. Pursue the prey, avoid the predators. Exactly. You listed off three B roles, and I'm like, you need to trust all three of those. <laughs> That's right. The trust may be exactly. different, but it's the same problem. It's the same problem. It's the mm-hmm. same problem. And then we go back to again, aiding, aiding trust, aiding decisions, listing action, reinforcing loyalty, informing experiences. These are these are shared challenges that we face almost universally. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have no excuse to learn from each other. Because oftentimes you might think, well, I'm not in the insurance category. <laughs> I'm a I, I sell bread, not 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 yeah. not not. But, I, but I, I'm, I got to trust you that your bread's not going to harm me as much as I have to trust you as a banker that my, my money is safe. 
Exactly. So, so what can we borrow from a bank to mm-hmm. help reinforce to help trust? A baker. And, it, and, it, and, and that's where I think creatively and, and sort of certainly is, is sort of a key driving force for me and certainly for us at, at Ogilvy, um, that it helps us to totally reshape the frame of reference you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So often we, we're in creative reviews or competitive reviews and we're saying, okay, well, so we're in, we're in the bread category. Let's see what other, other, other breads are doing. Right. Um, but and we failed to look them. at it. Totally. We failed to look at the same challenge just one step removed. It's interesting. I've often, and I've also this talking to marketing folks, like you are too immersed in your product. You care far more about your product than your customer does. Yes. And so you, you know, you're in a, you're in a place where it's like, of course they want to buy this. It's awesome. But they, you know, you know, you never got that kind of attention and likely never will. And yet you can still make yeah. sales. Like yeah. you've, you've got to change that and move it to things that they are concerned about. Or, or we need to invest in this because our competitors have just done that and we need to be this versus actually we, this is an issue of trust. There are many other spaces that we can learn from and change our category rather than just be aligned with it. Yeah. And that's where I think by being able to spot these ideas, see these patterns, have an approach by which we can sort of systematically come up with ideas through those and we can, we can really accelerate our, our innovation process. Fantastic. Uh, Sam, so much fun to talk to you. Thanks so much for your insight on this. It's really enjoyable. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much, Richard. And we'll talk to you next time on Understanding Consumer Nerds.